Welcome everyone to our 17th class of Sharbi Tafan with Devorah Leah and Drizier. I am your host, Chai Ben Shimon. We always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem can and will give to us. Let's give generously so Hashem will give us generously. I'm going to put some coins in the tzedakah box. Please join me from home. But Tzemak Tzedek uh, said that if we only knew the power of Tehillim, we would say it day and night. We are saying Psalm 20, Kapitel Chaf, for the hostages' immediate return home safely and all the protection of all the Chayalim and Chayalo in the IDF and um, the protection of all the Jews around the whole world. um, I'm going to introduce you to Dvorah Lea Andrusie. She is a Shara Bittachan enthusiast and a addiction recovery coach, and she wears many more hats, but that's what we are going to have for today. Thank you, Dvorah Lea. To, we're going to start with, we're we're on part 17, class 17 of Sharbi Tafan. Hi, everybody. So firstly, I'd like to apologize that we did not send out a recording yesterday. I am in Israel and my son had a day off from the army. And when he has a day off, that's it. He's my priority. So I apologize for that. I am very grateful to be in the Holy Land. I'm staying at my daughter's house with her husband and her two beautiful children. And it's really just an amazing time for me. Um, yesterday, when I was with my son, we went to Kikar Khatufim, which is the hostage corner in Tel Aviv. And I have to say, every time I go, it's more and more painful because there are hostage families there. And you can see the change in their faces, the changes in their body size, they all are very, very thin, which I'm sure at some point in the future, when, when the hostages are returned, that will be one of the silver linings, but their eyes are vacant and in pain. And really the, what they said to me was that they feel that people are just over it. We're over the war, we're over the hostages, we've moved on. You know, today in um, one of my chats, I was reading a chat and there's a woman who posts every single day what's happening in Israel, all the updates of Israel. And immediately after she posted what was going on in Israel and there were some painful things, two of the hostages are um, this morning, they told the families they were found, not found, but they found enough evidence to know that they're dead but between the courts and the rabbanim, the rabbis. So it's a very painful time and they really feel like they're forgotten. So it's it's incumbent on us to continue to remember Israel, to remember that although it's been 288 days and we're living our life as we're supposed to, we are supposed to continue and keep going because if we don't, then they automatically win, but still there has to be this passion and this drive to be concerned about the people of Israel because they are really, truly suffering. So now we are going to start with, I'm just going to give a brief little summary of where we're up to. Um, chapter three began with five introductory concepts that a person must internalize in order to make their bitachon complete. So we went through four. I'm just going to reiterate the four, and today we're going to go over the fifth. A person must understand that only God possesses the seven qualities that allow for trust, and therefore it follows that he should have bitachon in God and no one else. Number two is God knows even the innermost thoughts of a person, and therefore a person is not able to pay mere lip service to having bitachon. Hashem knows what we're feeling, and he knows when we are experiencing truth and when we are not experiencing truth. Number three is the person's trust should be solely on God and no one else in addition to God. And number four is bitachon ought to be combined with serving Hashem. So that was our last session that we learned. And 
the more that we begin to trust, the more it makes sense that we want to do the mitzvahs Hashem wants of us. And we compared it to humanity. If someone is consistently there for me and I know they care about me and they do what's right for me. And if I'm doing something incorrect, they let me know. If I'm doing something the right way, they give me the positive reinforcement. If that person were to ask me to do something that they would say is beneficial for me, not for them, for me, I would automatically want to do what they're telling me because it just makes logical sense. So here we are focusing on trusting Hashem and having him as our complete and total trust. Nothing happens to us, not good or bad, without the permission of Hashem. And the bad that we see as bad, we know to be good. So when Hashem says to us, these are your 613 mitzvahs, obviously we can't keep all of them today because we don't have a Beis HaMikdash. But the mitzvahs that we get from Hashem are actually good for us. So when we trust Hashem, it makes sense that what follows is I'm going to want to start doing what Hashem requires of me. Does that mean that overnight when we feel this trust that we become the perfect Jew? Like, please God, that should be, but it's not the case. We're humans and God made us that way as humans. But as long as we continue to have that God consciousness and when we disconnect or we do something that we shouldn't do, we actually are thinking about it. Just thinking about it will continue and then we will have the proper behaviors and the proper action. So now we're going to go to the page, bottom of page 79, where we're going to talk about the fifth trait. The fifth trait is human effort. And I know that in my personal classes that I teach live um, and also in the recordings, some of the questions were, how much effort is required? Why is effort required at all if Hashem says that he's going to take care of us regardless? Why don't I just rest on my laurels, do what I want to do, and have this absolute faith and trust that Hashem is going to take care of me? So here we're going to discuss why human effort is needed. So the fifth introduction addresses why in contrast to animals whose needs are readily available to them, a person is required to make great efforts to obtain his livelihood and other needs. We're on the bottom of page 79. The fifth introduction, the person should clearly see that the completion of all matters that come to be in this world after its creation come to be in one of two ways. One of the matters in which they come to be is solely due to the decrees of the creator, may he be exalted, and due to his desire that these things should immediately come into existence. The second manner in which they come to be is through various means and intermediaries. Some of these intermediaries are immediate, while some of them are remote. Some are revealed and some are hidden, but all of them hasten to complete that which God has decreed should be and the way those things should appear while God helps them accomplish this. Okay, so I'm just going to read this little paragraph. A person is required to know that while everything comes from Hashem, there are some things that God decreed should immediately come to be without any further action necessary, while there are other things that God decided should come into being through various means. So there, there's multiple different ways to explain this. Similarly, we could say a person... Hashem decides that this person is going to find a treasure or get an inheritance. They didn't have to work for that. It just came to them. The other way is I have to wake up in the morning and go to work and provide for my family. Another example of that is there's two types of bread where it's called lechem min ha'aretz, bread from the earth and lechem min shemayim, bread from the heaven. So what was bread from the heaven? We actually talked about the man in another class. Hashem gave man to the Jewish people. That was bread directly from heaven. They didn't have to prepare it. They didn't have to hunt for the food. Man came down every day, and every day they had the food that they needed. They still needed to make a small effort. In order to have the man, they would have to go out, and retrieve the man and actually put it into their mouths. 
So although it was man from heaven, it's considered bread from heaven, still there was a small part that the human had to put in a tiny effort of gathering the food and eating the food. So it says, why did Hashem give the Jewish people the man right before going into the desert, right before going into Israel, where they were going to have to work and wage wars and toil day and night, is Hashem was preparing them for that time. Here he was showing them, yes, it is bread from heaven, but still there's a small effort required here. You still have to go and retrieve it. So what is the end result of that? That yes, we need to make the effort, but we need to understand that although we're making the effort, everything is ordained by God. So I just want to briefly talk about, not in Shara Bitachon, but I think it brings out the point here. Of a few weeks ago, we had the portion in the Torah where they talked about the Maraglim, the spies going into Israel. And the majority of the spies came back with reports that were very, very scary for the people. They said, there's giants there. We're never going to be able to be successful. But in truth, what were the spies actually afraid of? They were not afraid of failure. They were not afraid that the Jewish people would lose. Because here they had, how many miracles did they see happen to the Jewish people? Hashem led them free from Egypt. Hashem crossed the Yom Sof, he split the sea for them. They had man for, for the whole entire time that way they were in the desert. How could they not believe that the Jewish people would be successful? So they were not afraid of failure. They were afraid of success. Why were they afraid of success? What were the Jewish people doing? What were they busy with in the desert? They were busy learning and they were busy connecting with Hashem because they didn't have to do any labor. Life was easy for them. Hashem organized everything that they needed. They had the well from Miriam. They had the man from, from the sky. Everything was taken care of for them. They did not have to work. So their lives were completely involved in Torah and in connection with Hashem. And they didn't want to leave that space. They wanted to stay in that holy space. And Hashem clearly said to them, that's not what I want from you. That's not what I want from you. What I want from you is to be involved in the physical world and elevate the physical. Take the physical things that have no spirituality in them, no holiness in them, and make a blessing on an apple and elevate the sparks. Elevate each spark which is why they were so so badly punished, is because they didn't want to continue the way that Hashem wanted. They wanted to be like an island unto themselves, like people who go off into the wilderness or, or and, and sit there and commune with God. That's very nice, but that's not what Hashem wants of the Jewish people. What Hashem wants of the Jewish people is to be in the world, live in physicality, experience physicality, and elevate that physicality because that's the ultimate, what we want ultimately, that is what will bring Mashiach. Okay, so we're gonna continue now. Top of page 81. An example of immediate cause would be the drawing of water from the depths of the earth by means of a pulley and a jug tied to it that, the, that draws the water out of the well. Very simple way, you put a jug with a pulley and you get the water out of the well. The remote cause would be the person who ties the animal to rope that is attached to the vessel and his moving of the animal that pulls the rope to draw the water from deep within the well to the surface. So there's many more steps that need to be taken. Then there are those causes that are between a person and the vessels that are being used to draw out the water, which are intermediary causes between the two matters. There's the animal, the wheels that move each other, and the rope. If any of these aforementioned causes were ruined, the intended goal of, goal of drawing the water would not come to be. Similarly, for other actions that come to be, they do not come to be as a result of people's actions or through any other entity. Rather, they all exist due to a decree of Hashem and his preparation of the means through which the action will be completed. So here it's talking about different ways where 
Sometimes it's very easy. For example, I have my cup of water. Amen. So here's my cup of water. Somebody poured this cup of water for me. It's readily available. I still have to do some effort. I still have to pick up the cup, make a bracha, and drink. The other, more with more intermediaries, would be me needing to pick myself up, go to the fridge, open the free fridge, take out the seltzer, pour myself a drink. And if any of the things that were needed, here we talked about the wheels and the wagon. So if a wheel broke or the, the chariot wasn't working that they were the way that they were supposed to, they would not be able to accomplish what they were trying to accomplish. Okay. So the Alta Rebbe explains on this, that, that they all exist due to a decree and his preparation of the means through which the action will be completed. So what... So the Alta Rebbe shared on what we just read in the second chapter, um, sorry, yeah, the, the third chapter, where it says everything, they all exist to the due to the decree of God, his preparation of the means through which the action will be completed. So the Alter Rebbe's comment on this is that many people have financial concerns, but those financial concerns do not take away from their love of Hashem. And then he says, a businessman who goes to work every day, we think that a, a tzaddik or someone who learns all the time has more of a connection with Hashem. And here the, the Alter Rebbe is saying that someone who goes to work every day and believes in Hashem, has the munah and is working on his bitachon, during his business day, he sees so many different things of how it worked out, how something that could have went wrong went right. And he understands not just in a holy space, but in the physical world, he has a deep understanding of Hashem is orchestrating everything that I'm doing. The things, the deal, the business deal that I tried to make that didn't work out, he says to himself, thank you, Hashem. I really wanted that deal to work out, but if you didn't let that deal work out, then I know it wasn't something that's good for me. So their connection someone who's out in the world and still connecting with Hashem, it's a deeper type of connection because they're relating to it on their daily lives. It's not just, I'm secluding myself, I'm putting myself off in the corner, I'm not going to interact with humanity, and I'm going to be holy. That is significantly easier to do that. Yes, you have to make a lifetime commitment that you're putting yourself separate from humanity. But Hashem doesn't want that from us. So the businessman, the housewife, Every single human who is not just in a lofty space all the time, throughout their day, throughout my day, I'm speaking to Hashem. It's not necessarily that I'm opening up a sitter, but every single moment of my day, I'm thanking Hashem. I'm asking Hashem. I'm being grateful to Hashem. I'm saying, you know, I could use a little bit more revealed blessings, Hashem, but it's throughout my physical actions that I'm doing here taking care of hanging out with my grandchildren in Miami with my children or our community, interacting with the real world gives us a bigger goal and a bigger idea of where Hashem is for us in our actual daily lives. Okay, so now we're gonna continue one last sentence. Oh, no, we're on the top of page 82. And here he's just bringing Sukkim from the Navi, from the Torah, to prove what he's saying. As it says in Yirmiyahu, who is great in counsel and master in carrying it out? And as it says, for it was something brought about by the Lord. If the means were lacking, then nothing would come to be as a result of the natural activities. What does that mean? We just talked about it, but it's saying it here again, is I could plan to make dinner, standing in my kitchen and I'm ready to make dinner, and all of a sudden, I'm missing a key ingredient. My result is not going to be the result that I want it to be if I don't have everything that I need. Okay, proof that human interventions is often needed. What We're in the middle of page 82. 
when we contemplate a person's needs and how he is required to engage in various means and to exert himself in order to obtain his needs, then we will clearly observe this to be the case that without the various means, the matter will not come into actuality. For when someone needs food, even if the food is placed in front of him in a state already fit to eat, if he doesn't exert himself to eat, if he doesn't exert himself by raising it to his mouth and chewing, he will not satiate his hunger. Similarly, someone who is thirsty and in need of water will also need to raise the water to his mouth to drink. So let's just go back to the bread of heaven and the bread of earth. Both, both come from Hashem. So it's not the actual event that is not that is making the difference. It's our perception. The Jewish people, even though they had to make that small effort, still believed that the mun was bread from heaven. And when we go out and we work and we toil and we provide for our families, we believe that it's because of us. What is Hashem telling us? What is this book telling us? That both the manna from heaven and the manna from earth, the bread of earth and the bread of heaven, are both from Hashem. We need to make the effort. But if Hashem doesn't want it to be, it won't be. So it's equal the bread from heaven and the bread from earth are both still from God, but the perception in our minds is different. When we change that perception and we talked about bitachon is changing the way you think, changing your mentality. So when we start to do that, we realize that not, not just the things that are handed to us and not the things that we toil for, all of them are directly from Hashem. And we're going to end the class here Thank you all for being here and we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, just want to share the quote of the, the class, which is we're going into 18, but here it goes. Give me a moment. Gonna share it with all of you. Okay. Happiness is found in living a life of purpose and meaning rather than pursuing material possessions. That is a quote of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, just want to share with you all, we are going to post on the descriptions of the class we've been it's requested of one through 16 of the classes. So on this recording, you will see in the descriptions one through 16th, and we're going to try to do that weekly as well. So you can catch up. Um, we have a YouTube channel under Chaya Ming. Subscribe today. C-H-A-Y-A-M-I-N-K. Um, we have over 139 classes of people sharing their life journeys and stories, as well as the Sharbi Tuchan series with Devorah Lea. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. We do this class in memory of our dear grandmothers, Rivka Dina, Bas Yosef Yehuda, and Rachel Bela Bashneer Zalman. I hope they're proud and they are proud. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you for class number 18.